Deer management is an issue that influences all of us, whether we hunt or not. The white-tailed deer have enormous impacts on our forests, on our agriculture, and on many other aspects of our lives as well. Attempting to raise more deer than this land can sustain is really the greatest mistake in the history of wildlife management. It is a mistake which threatens our forest ecosystem. It threatens the future of hunting itself. And that is why we are currently making some of the most sweeping changes in the history of Pennsylvania to deer management. In order to understand where we are today, it really helps to understand how we got here. That by the 1890s, 110 years ago or so, our ancestors had already converted nearly 70% of Penn's woods to agriculture, and deer were nearly exterminated from the entire state. Soon after, antlerless deer were totally protected, and the remaining forests were clear-cut. And when those forests started to regenerate, it really set the stage for uh, deer population explosions, which they did. And by the 1930s, our big woods areas were already seriously overbrowsed. But biologists were not able to convince uh, most of the hunters on the need to shoot these does. You cannot control a deer population by just shooting bucks. Uh, we've been holding doe seasons since 1957, every single year. But largely, those harvests have been inadequate to control the deer herd, prevent further overbrowsing. Hunters have been very effective at applying political pressure on our legislators and on our policymakers to prevent the Game Commission from bringing these herds under control for nearly seven decades. And it isn't the fault, I think, of the legislators. It's not the fault of the policymakers or even the sportsmen. I think the problem has been we've never really effectively communicated the need for why we need to do these things, and why it's really in the sportsman's best interest to do it, not only for them, but for the resource as well. We've learned that when people understand what it is we're trying to do, and why it's in their own best interest, they do support us. Clearly, education is the key. And that's the purpose of this video, to inform, to educate, and to win support for the necessary changes that we must implement to improve our deer management program. To properly manage deer, we must understand the relationship that exists between deer and their environment. When deer are held in balance, they and their environment remain healthy. This is excellent deer habitat. It's just thousands of stems everywhere you look. Unlike much of Pennsylvania where the vegetation has been stripped below five feet, look at the vegetation here. It's all over the place. This has got to be heaven for deer. They come in here and there's so much to eat that we know that in areas like this, does will grow much more rapidly. They'll breed uh, at younger ages, approximately when they reach about 80 pounds. They'll have larger litters, have more fawns. The fawns will have larger weights at birth. Does will have so much energy that they'll be able to produce more milk. Fawns will grow more rapidly. In this habitat that's so dense, they can hide from the predators, have a greater chance of surviving. When deer populations are allowed to become overly abundant, they'll ruin their habitat, not just for themselves, but for many other species that would normally live there as well. Here we are in the forests of north central Pennsylvania, a very typical scene here. And this is an area where thousands of hunters came here decades ago and would see 100, 150 deer a day. And now they come here and they only see 5 or 10 deer a day. They're very upset about that. Uh, in fact, they've even suggested we should close down doe seasons in some of these areas. Or that we might even want to stock deer here. We have to understand how deer make a living. Deer, like all of us, have to eat and have to find good nutrition in order to grow and reproduce and survive. But when we get down and we look at this habitat, there's almost nothing here for deer to eat. They have already eaten it. And we want to know, can these forests recover? The question we want to know is, is it deer? Even though there may only be a small number of deer here, are there enough deer to eat off everything that's here, even though we're not seeing many deer? And the second thing is, if we reduce the number of deer in this area, can this forest come back? Is there hope that our children and grandchildren will have a forest after these trees die? And to answer those questions, we started some experiments right here. Four years ago, where I'm standing in all of this area off to my left, looked exactly like the forest you see behind me here. Three years ago, we came in and we cut down trees like this one. And all of the trees, or most of the trees are removed. Just a few remain, which are the ones you see here now. 
The difference is that we put a fence up to exclude deer right here. So this half was not treated. This half is treated in that it keeps the deer from getting inside. And what you can see is very, very obvious. The only plants that live out here are the plants that the deer don't eat. When you go on the inside of the fence, look at the vegetation. Scores of different species of plants, tremendous regeneration. The two things that we learned from this experiment is, one, it's deer. Two, the good news is that this forest still has the ability to come back. This is not just a hunting issue. This is an environmental ecological issue, and we must address it. Deer, of course, are not the only problem affecting forest regeneration. Acid rain, poor soils, insect infestations, and defoliations can also be compounding factors influencing forest health. But when the next generation of trees and shrubs only grow inside a fence like we just saw, or inside plastic tubing like we see here, deer are clearly the primary problem. Attempting to raise more deer than the land can sustain has been the greatest mistake in the history of Pennsylvania wildlife management. And it's a mistake that, if not corrected, threatens the very future of our forests and of hunting itself. If we, the hunters, refuse to control this deer herd, society will be forced to find another way to do it. We should never forget that less than 10% of our population are hunters. And in a democratic society, it's the majority who decides what will happen. For hunters and hunting to survive, at least as we know it, we must make the transition from hunters engaged in a sport of self-gratification to hunters providing a free environmental ecological service for all of society, keeping the deer herd under control and maintaining a healthy forest ecosystem for everyone. Society doesn't care what hunters want for ourselves. It cares about what we can do for them. But when landowners realize what we can do for them, they'll be much more likely to allow hunting on their lands. In terms of the management of white-tailed deer here in Pennsylvania, we have two primary goals. The first is by far the most important, and that's to balance this deer herd with its environment. The second is to restore a more natural breeding ecology of deer, which will also lead to an improved buck-to-doe ratio, larger bucks, and we believe, greater hunter satisfaction. Something I only learned after I got this job that absolutely shocked me was that Pennsylvania kills a greater percent of their antlered bucks than any state in the country. In some parts of Pennsylvania, over 90% of all the bucks that are harvested consist of yearlings. That's a statistic that really needs to change. We know that bucks are in the prime of their life. They grow their largest antlers between the ages of four and eight. In the state of Pennsylvania, believe it or not, less than one in a hundred ever live to their fourth birthday. We're not letting our bucks grow up. With Pennsylvania having so few bucks, especially adult bucks, and so many does, we're concerned about what impacts this may be having on the basic breeding ecology of our deer. In deer populations throughout the world, competition is usually intense between bucks for the privilege to mate. And it's usually the biggest, strongest prime age bucks that do most of the mating. But clearly, that is not the case here in Pennsylvania. Historically, our two-week buck season followed by a three-day doe season consistently led to overharvest of bucks and underharvest of does. Bucks have largely been overharvested because of the lack of any substantial limit on either the size of bucks' antlers or on the number of hunters allowed to participate. Does have largely been underharvested because of political influences and bad weather during short doe seasons. In an effort to provide a more natural breeding ecology, with more bucks living beyond the yearling age class, and to balance this deer herd with its environment, we've already made some changes, and it's quite likely you're gonna see us make some more. They may include things like concurrent buck and doe seasons, doe seasons prior to the November rut, and even changes in our antler restrictions. People often ask, you know, why did we establish this concurrent buck and doe season? And it's designed to try and decrease the impact of weather on the doe harvest, Historically, we're shooting two-thirds of our does in 10 hours on the first day of doe season. I think often they were not looking those deer over. They were not as careful. 23% uh, of those antlerless deer were button bucks. By giving them two full weeks, we hope that they'll make a wiser choice. Take your time. Make a wiser choice. Stay off of those fawns. Go after the adult does, and you will not be shooting as many of the bucks. Another thing we believe is that 
there are a number of hunters out there who hunt primarily for the traditional values of providing food for themselves and their families through the craft of hunting. With our old hunting seasons, they nearly always shot a buck. But now, with a concurrent two-week season, they can shoot a doe instead. That should help to bring the doe herd under control and at the same time, allow the buck population to build up. One significant change we've made recently is the establishment of October antlerless seasons. In terms of what's best for the deer herd, we believe October is by far a better time to harvest does than the traditional December season. This helps improve the buck doe ratio when it really matters most, just in time for the rut. It makes a lot more sense, we think, to harvest does in October before the bucks waste their energy on breeding them than in December after they're pregnant. Also, October doe seasons may actually reduce the buck kill. Hunters who put venison in their freezer from does in October, we believe, may be less likely to shoot small bucks for venison during the regular deer season. Another advantage of the October season is that it will save the forest from six extra weeks of browsing from those deer that we removed. Of all the things that we could do to increase the number and the quality of bucks in our deer herd and improve our breeding ecology, I know of nothing that would do it as dramatically as changing our antler restrictions. Our traditional antler restriction required bucks to have two or more points on one antler or a spike three or more inches in length. By increasing the number of points required to be legal, we could protect a significant percentage of our younger bucks, allowing them to live longer. This should enormously increase the number of bucks living at least one more year. What does this mean to hunters? In the long term, hunters would likely see more and larger bucks than they have ever seen in the past. The majority of these bucks that live to age two and older should have eight or more points. What does this mean to non-hunters? By increasing the number and the age of our bucks in this population, it should restore a much more natural breeding ecology than we have ever seen in our entire lives. With regard to research, we're not just reading books and staring at computer screens. We're launching some of the largest studies of white-tailed deer in the country because we recognize that the more we learn about deer, the better we can manage them. One aspect of research that we really focused in on was the breeding biology of female deer. And we wanted to know, you know, when they were mating, when they were giving birth, what percent were pregnant, and how many fawns they were actually giving birth to. Our wildlife conservation officers all over Pennsylvania pitched in, and the first year examined over 1,000 does. 608 of those does were pregnant and gave us usable data where they actually measured the length of the embryo. And when you know the length of the embryo and when that mother died, you can actually calculate when she bred and when she would have given birth. And what we learned was that the average date of breeding was November the 17th. But we had them mating as early as the 9th of September all the way through to the 16th of February, spanning five full months. But about 90% of these does actually bred between the middle of October and the middle of December. And the fawns were born on the average around June 2nd, but 90% of the fawns were born during the months of May and June. We know that 89% of the adult does are mating and that on the average, 35% of them have a single fawn, 62% have two fawns, 3% have three fawns. Uh, what did we learn? We don't have a biological disaster, but we feel that if we improve the buck doe ratio, we can certainly improve the basic breeding biology of deer. The first major research project that we launched was what we call the fawn mortality study, and we wanted to know what's killing our fawns. And to do that, you have to capture them and put radio collars on them and follow them around. And the study design called for radio collaring 160 fawns in, in two areas. And when we talked about doing that with other researchers, they were very skeptical about whether we could catch them or not. And what we did is we teamed up with the Penn State Wildlife Research Unit. We got about 20 kids each year involved in this study. And they went out there and walked for miles and miles and miles and located these fawns, put radio collars on them. But the one thing that makes a difference between a good research team and a great research team is a great team will adapt when they get in trouble. They got in trouble. They couldn't catch the fawns in Quihanna by walking. They switched their strategies around using vehicles, locating suspicious does, and they not only met the quota of 160, in our two-year study, they caught 218 fawns and radio collared them. It's the largest study of its kind in the United States. And I cannot overly praise the efforts of Penn State Wildlife Research Unit and those students. They did a fabulous job. 
they let us learn about what's killing our fonts. What did we learn? Yes, coyotes are killing fonts, but bears are actually killing just as many or more than the coyotes are, at least in some areas. I spent my whole life studying bears. I couldn't believe that they were that effective at catching them. Now, in terms of predation, it was a lot more serious in the Quihanna area, over browsed big woods, than it was in the agricultural areas. And in terms of hunting mortality, we were absolutely shocked at those results because we thought the hunters would kill a lot of these in hunting season. And as it turns out, 47 of them were being monitored the first year during hunting season. Hunters only took one. One question we wanted to answer is how large are the bucks of Pennsylvania? How large will they grow if they get to live longer? And one of the things we did here is we went out with 34 teams into every county of Pennsylvania and we measured 3,184 sets of antlers. What did we learn? This is your average yearling. Does he look familiar? He ought to look very familiar because 80% of the bucks that we take in hunting season are yearling bucks. The question we want to answer is what happens if we let them live another year? What if we let them live two years? If we let them live one more year, this guy turns into this guy. Typically around eight points, around a 15 inch spread. What if you let them live another year? Here's your average buck, three and older in the state of Pennsylvania, right here. It's your yearling, here's your three-year-old. This is not about how big they grow in Texas with supplemental feed. This is how big they grow in the wilds of Pennsylvania, just as things are. If we can find ways of keeping these bucks alive several more years, the results will be absolutely dramatic. We've launched a series of research projects that are designed to study the movements and behavior of both deer as well as the hunters themselves. Now one of these studies is going to focus in on what we call dispersal patterns. And we radio collar a large numbers of little button bucks while they're still with their mothers. And when they leave, we try and see when do they leave their mother, do they keep living in the same area where they raised, or do they go off into another area, and how far away do they go. We're very interested in another study to look at what we call activity patterns. What hours of the day are they active? We hypothesize that older, big racked bucks tend to be more nocturnal. Are they? We don't really know, but we'll find out when we put what we call activity monitors on these radio cars, we actually tell what they're doing, when they're active and when they aren't. Another study we've started in conjunction with Penn State involves putting GPS units, global positioning system units, on hunters and actually following them to see where they go. We want to see how long they hunt, how far from roads they hunt, and in general learn more about their movement patterns and their hunting success. This information should help us learn more about how to control deer herds, especially in remote areas. One fascinating study we hope to launch in the near future involves following both deer and hunters at the same time in the same area. Deer will be wearing radio collars and hunters will be carrying GPS units. This study should help us learn more about hunters, how they hunt, and how deer actually avoid them. Another aspect of our research is going to focus on surveys. We want to do surveys on hunters and also on landowners. We want to know who they are, we'd like to know what they want, and we'd like to know how we can help them. And within the boundaries of proper wildlife management, once we learn more about what they want, we could probably give them more of what they want. But it has to stay within the bounds of proper wildlife management. We cannot mismanage the resource just because they want to do it a certain way. And with landowners, we're very curious to know the same things. Who are they? Uh, what do they want? And how can we help them? And for example, do they allow hunters to hunt on their property? If they do, then under what conditions do they? If they don't, then why don't they? And under what conditions would you allow hunters to hunt on that property? What we're going to try and do with these surveys, as we learn more about both hunters as well as landowners, is try and put the hunters and the landowners together to meet their needs, to bring the deer herds under control for the benefit of the landowner, provide a service to the landowner, but also provide recreation for the hunters. We have a number of areas in north central Pennsylvania where uh, long-term over-browsing has had an enormous impact on the forest ecosystem. In fact, it's really threatening the very future of that forest ecosystem. And in those areas, we'd like to establish what we call forest restoration sites. And in there, we want to establish more liberal hunting uh, limits so that we can actually reduce the number of deer and measure what happens. How well can the forest recover? What happens to the vegetation over time? What happens to the deer over time? And what we believe is if we reduce deer densities in those areas, we can start repairing those forests, which I think we have an obligation to do. But also, we want to monitor what impacts it have on deer. We suspect that the condition of deer will improve. They'll probably start breeding at younger ages, larger litters, higher survival, nicer antlers. Uh, those are things with deer.
But we also want to know how this is going to influence grouse, and turkey, songbirds, other wildlife, and vegetation. We think this study has great potential to show that hunters and hunting can and will control these deer populations to improve the forest, providing a free environmental ecological service for all of society. And we believe that this is very much the future of hunting. One aspect of our research is going to really focus in on our current deer management program. We recognize we don't have a perfect program. What we want to do is go over that and evaluate every piece of it. If it's working, fine, we'll keep it. If it isn't, we need to modify it, improve it, try and build the best possible program we can. We definitely are interested in looking at what we call GIS-based management units, geographical information system, habitat-based instead of by political boundaries. We're very interested in looking at better ways of estimating our deer populations, better ways of estimating reporting rates. We want to look more at the environmental impacts of deer uh, throughout the state. We want to be able to address the needs of private landowners. This idea of one size fits all doesn't work. We're going to have to try and be more flexible about meeting the needs of the 12 million people who live in this state so we can provide a better package. It's going to take us some time. It's going to take a lot of change, a lot of evaluation, but we definitely have tremendous potential to improve this program. As we learn more about our deer and our people, we're going to have better information on which to make wiser decisions. We've made a lot of changes in this deer management program and we're going to probably make a lot more. You can't take this program from where it is today to where it has to go without making a lot of changes. And some of these changes are going to be mistakes. When we make mistakes, we're going to admit them, we're going to move on. There is no quick fix. This is going to take time, it's going to take a great deal of planning, it's going to take a lot of hard work. But none of this is going to happen unless we learn to work together.